is Joe Bitar. This is Ramon Robles. And we talk to fascinating people about their love of hunting, shooting sports, and the outdoors. This is Hunting Matters. Ramon. Good to see you, Joe Bitar. Look who's here. I, I can see hey. him. You recognize that guy? Very handsome, very rugged. <laughs> Did you brush your teeth today, Razor? <laughs> I don't know. I could have. I don't know. <laughs> well, for I those could, I, I started flossing this year, though. Oh, just, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. So. What what happened to Ramon? If people can tell, we're a professional operation here. We're fine. That's just dental floss. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, for for the uh, for the folks who are who are joining us on uh, this week's episode of Hunting Matters uh, podcast with Ramon and Joe, the. Uh, Gentleman, you see before you is Razor Dobbs, the one and only Razor Dobbs, who was our very first guest, Ramon, 200 episodes ago. And I think I owe you a dollar because you said uh, we, we'd get here. And I said we'd never get here. Yeah. You, you thought the show would be canceled in a week, but right. they can't cancel it because we own it. <laughs> <laughs> it's very well, this, is, this is better, too, because it's a podcast. No, no interruptions, no yep. walls, right. nothing. Yeah, no, no, no interruptions at all, and uh, we can say whatever we want to. Razor, I, I know that you've kind of got a foul mouth, so probably need to tone it down a little bit. But how you been, man? Hey, good. I've been doing real good. But let, let me ask you a question. Okay. Where in the world did you get that mountain lion? That's the ugliest one I've ever seen in my life. Wow. Which that, mountain lion? The one behind you. The one with the horns. <laughs> anyway. Which one? You no, oh, right. that, I thought that was a mountain lion. That's a sheep. No, it's an. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, go ahead. You've got a mountain lion behind you, though, don't you? Yeah, but he's not that big of one. There he is. That's okay. But, but, I just didn't matter. I just had fun. It was had fun. Yeah, no, so, that's but, that's my New Zealand wall behind me. That's the Arapawa, the, the chamois, and the tar. Okay. Well, I'll start acting cool whenever we go live. Oh, we are live. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to wreck your thing. <laughs> Razor, what's happening out in uh, the blade lands of Kerrville, Texas today? Oh, man, not a lot. Uh, it's, uh, thank God it's not 100 degrees right now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in the low 90s, which is really, really nice. There's a lot, a lot of deer, a lot of fawn crop. So there's a lot of uh, uh, winds running around and turkeys. I, Joe, you, you've hunted out here with turkeys. Yeah. And there was a pretty good amount of turkeys. There's so many turkeys right now. It's crazy. Really? Yeah, it, it really is. It, it's really, really nice. Is it green? You still, I know it's been dry lately, but you have a, you have a pretty green summer out there, didn't you? Yeah, pretty much. And, um, and then it started getting kind of dry and then we had a pretty good rain, uh, last week. So, so it hasn't been bad, man. Nobody's yeah. complaining. Yeah. I talked to our buddy Leo down at DEA ranch in South Texas and he said they are covered up in turkeys this year. They had a huge hatch. Yeah. Yeah, it was funny. There was a there was a like two hens and I don't know like thirty chicks. You yeah, know, I watched them. You know, the little bitty, and I thought, well, I wonder how many will make it. And and they were, I'd see them around, I'd see them, around, and I saw them all summer, the whole thing. And they got big. Now they're like turkeys, you know, yeah. like real big turkey. And it's like they made it. Wow. And there's a lot of predators out here, so yeah, good for them. That's so, cool. How do you exciting. think they made it? What happened? Uh, was it rain or what? I, you know what? I don't know. I mean, the rain helped, but uh, probably because Joe didn't come hunting last year. Well, I, yeah. I wasn't there. That's, yeah. that's why. But no, it, it really is. It, it really is cool. I mean, the fawn crops is huge and everything looks really good. Really, yeah. really good. So the um, <clears throat> I learned something uh, not too long ago. I was talking to, like I said, Leo down at DEA and we were talking, we were listening to this. I was listening to a podcast of the uh, turkey biologist on there. And he said, you know, he said the thing about it, about your habitat. He said, one of the biggest things about turkeys is, is proper habitat management. And I didn't think about this. I've hunted, hunted them for years, but never thought about this. He said, turkeys like to, you know, you think, well, let's hunt in the area where the grass is high. You've been to DA. So mm -hmm. um, let's hunt where the grass is high. They've got cover. That's great. That's great. This biologist blew my mind. He said, your area where you're hunting turkey needs to be mowed, basically. You need to have areas cut, which is ideal if, you have, if you're managing that property, because they like to see just above their, their eye line for predators versus hiding from predators and tall cover. Right. 
they like to feed and be able to look up and, and see all the way around them. So they avoid areas with tall grass. Did you know that? Well, not really. I mean, I knew they, they, they didn't like deep cover, but I didn't really. I mean, that kind of explains too maybe why they're doing so good because I cleared a ton of cedar out and made like this big park. I call it Sylvia's Park. That's my wife, Sylvia. Yeah. And it's really pretty, real, real pretty. And it, I did that like two years ago and we didn't have any rain. It was horrible. It was just like black dirt left. And then now it's just wonderful. It's a park. Yeah. And that's where they live. They roost there and then they make their rounds. They go to the river. I mean, they go all the way around, and but they go back and roost right up in there. So, so what you're saying is next spring, we don't have to go find them. You know where they are. <laughs> I know. We're, we're going to shoot them from the hot tub. <laughs> <laughs> Which Sylvia is gone. Last time, last time Razor and I did this, we rode all over his property looking for birds and we found them. But the, the, he killed two turkeys, Ramon, in one shot. But we called them for what, Razor, an hour, 45 minutes oh, to an man. hour? No, Joe called it. I mean, it was, it, it, it was a long, long, but we could hear him. And, yeah. and sure enough, here they come. I mean, it, I mean, it was an hour. You yeah. pulled them in from way, way, way out there. Yeah. And they were. You, yeah. And I was sick. Remember, I was recovering from rhabdo or whatever. Remember, I was not, I wasn't doing good. Yeah. Your rabies, you remember that? Your rabies shot hadn't kicked in yet. <laughs> yeah, really. Did you have but, some uh, rhabdomyelitis or something? Yeah, that was from that uh, race thing. That was, that was in 22. Or 2020? Yeah. yeah, man, the years are years are flying. Let's, while That's we're on that crazy. topic, while we're on that topic, um, so most people know you from outdoor television. Um, you did that for nine years. Yeah, I did the TV show for nine in, years in front in front of the camera. Yeah, and then uh, the many many years behind it, and then you've kind of you've kind of pivoted a little bit. Uh, you're not you're not involved in, with outdoor television uh, at this point. Um, but you've been involved in something else. So the racing world has consumed you. And I know, I know yeah. you're, you're an adrenaline junkie. So tell us a little bit about racing, what type of racing you're involved with, how you got started and kind of what's happening now, what's next. Okay. Well, the, the racing that I do, it's, it's called desert racing. So if you've ever, and most people have, if you're, if you've ever heard of the Baja 1000, or people say, let's go Baja or what, you know, whatever. That is desert racing. That, that's an endurance race across the desert. And there there's races all over the world that are desert races. And, and they, they race everything from motorcycles to UTVs to buggies of every shape and form to million dollar trucks mm -hmm. to giant trucks. You know what I mean? It's crazy. So, so, uh, so that's what it, you have a navigator and you're going, it's a really rough course and you pretty much on any off road desert race like this, half of the cars, 40 to 50% of all the cars do not finish. Mm -hmm. They break down or crash out. I mean, the, the attrition rate, that is the trick. And, and you're talking about when you go race one of these things, you had your car so dialed in, I mean, between every race, you basically tear the whole car down and put it back together. Mm. And so, and then knowing that in this coming race, if it's 250 miles or it's a thousand miles, you know, you got a 50% chance that it's not going to make it. Mm. So that's what, that's what, and I've always loved the desert in the desert racing. It's, you know, it's adrenaline fuel, but it's long. So it's a lot of strategy in it, and it's not just flooring it. I mean, cause you have to keep that car alive. You have to go as fast as you can possibly go and keep the car alive. And um, you have a navigator that's calling all the shots and, and doing, you know, it's just major strategy, major teamwork. And, uh, and it's just, and then you, you got all the clothes on. So you, you look cool. And, uh, yeah. but, but it's fun. It's fun. I've done, um, I've done a lot of races and then I, I competed in uh, two, uh, it's called the Mint 400 in Las Vegas or iconic big desert races, televised stuff. Uh, finished both of those, raced those, and uh, I'm going to do that one again. And then uh, in November, we're going to go race the Baja 1000. That's the biggest one in the world. Hmm. And um, so how exciting. long is that one? How long is that one, Razor? Well, it's typically a thousand miles. Okay. 
And um, but it may be they haven't released the course map yet. And um, so it could be twelve hundred, could be eight fifty. You don't know. Yeah. Until you get until you get the course map. And then uh, then we'll go to like the race is November 15th. And um, but we'll go down like 10 days in advance and pre run and map out our sections. And you got to figure it's a logistic. Uh, uh, I want to say nightmare, but it's not a night, but it's just the logistics are so incredibly difficult because you have, yeah. you know, chase trucks that are pitting. And I mean, you know, you're out in the middle of nowhere and they're trying to get to you and, uh, and you got, you know, depends on how many miles it is. You got 30 hours to do a thousand miles. And, uh, do you, do you have a, 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 do you use the same person as your navigator? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've had two, this is the second one that I've had for, you know, pretty much almost the whole time. And he's, it's funny. He's ex military. And after military, he was a contractor and, uh, and in Iraq and, and what they specialized in was taking high, high priority, uh, a clients through, you know, blazing through Baghdad in, in these caravans and you, and he, so, so it's funny. Uh, he is such a natural and you cannot shake this guy. Cause typically when I test people out, I'd take them out at the ranch and we get in the car and I just see how fast you can scare them. You know what I mean? Like, Oh my God, you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause you're trying to find the threshold, you know? Sure. And you can't, you, this guy is like texting on it. This is no joke. Texting on this Apple watch because our comms went down and we're flying through the desert. It's bouncing. And he's, and I thought he was lying, but I could hear, we could receive on the radio, but we couldn't transmit. So he was texting and I could hear our pitch. And I was like, this is not real. How does he even see that? And he's just calm and cool. And, and, uh, so it just, it's awesome. I can't even text on my watch when I'm taking a, you know, to sit on the, on the couch. I know it's hard <laughs> enough, and I don't know. No, no glasses. You know, uh, no nothing. Uh, He's just, but, uh, but, and, but it's a lot of fun. The strategy and um, is is so fun, and it's a high risk because you don't want to get stranded. You know, like in Baja, if you get stranded out there, you're looking at twenty, staying in the desert twenty eight to thirty six hours waiting wow. on help. You know depending on where you are and, and um and you know there's a i don't know it's just uh i love it i just love it it's still you, not as dangerous as houston though yeah exactly <laughs> yeah 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 it's not as dangerous as driving downtown houston <laughs> yeah or and actually like, like in baja like in baja the most dangerous part of racing the baja are your chase trucks those are your trucks that are on the highways trying to leapfrog to 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 get to to the next pit that's the most dangerous mm. because the highways are crazy 18 wheelers flying and i mean no rules you know what wow. i mean and i mean people it's i'm not getting into it but the baja 1000 man there's a lot of carnage and it's not on the race course you know yeah. it's dangerous so it is fun don't hope sylvia doesn't watch this <laughs> <laughs> we'll tell razors uh uh, uh ramon's going to call her as soon as we're off there and send her an advanced <laughs> copy how, how yeah. many how many contestants in that race in the 1000 man i don't know there's hundreds hundreds maybe a thousand i don't know hmm. i know like the mint 400 there's hundreds i mean yeah. there's so many classes and i mean it is you know and there's so many other races all over i mean there's so many different things and and uh uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's been going on since like the sixties and the Baja 1000 and, uh, there's just nothing like it. There's people that raise it from all over the, all over the world. You know, I, I remember I was at the mint 400 and we were in the grid on the grid and there's this truck and it was a, it was a Japanese team came all the way from Japan, hmm. this killer truck, you know, all decked out. And I was like, man, this is a beautiful truck. They couldn't speak English, you know? <laughs> and, uh, there's people from all over the world, all of, and you have big teams, you know, you, know, you got million dollar vehicles and huge teams all the way down just to, you know, normal people putting together what they can put together and racing. You know, it's really wild. Ramon, I think we ought to get that go-kart out of your, ga your garage yeah. and, and jack it up. <laughs> you want to do that? Strap I'll your two boys it. on the back? 
<laughs> I'll navigate with Siri. You know? <laughs> All right, it says, hold on, let me zoom. Is that example? Hey, where's that Taco Bell I saw five minutes ago? <laughs> yeah, we got this. No. But uh, what, one thing, one thing, the, mo the most exciting thing, though, I got to tell you the story. So I remember I was getting ready, and and I had never done like like long races, you know. And when I was getting ready to do long races, I was thinking, you know, especially now that I got older, I I got pee a little bit more than I used yeah. to. I was like, well, how do you pee? Right. And then the old days, they would just pee. Yeah. You know. They like let a marathon runner, you just let it rip. And what they what they would do when if they if they got to the podium or, or whenever you finish, you go up on the big ramp for the interview. They would have one of their pit guys pour a bucket of water in their lap so they couldn't tell anyway. Whatever. Hmm. So, but what you do is you wear these. You wear a catheter, Texas catheter. Yes, yeah. you wear this condom kind of catheter. Yeah. And let me tell you something. If I would have known about that, I would have worn those hunting for. You know, 20 years ago, I've been wearing a catheter. Honey, I'm because I'll be in the blind or in the tree and I'm in there 20 minutes and I have to pee. There's no, but it is so cool that catheter because you're just like, mm hmm, just carrying on a conversation with whoever, male, female, your wife, inside. So it doesn't matter. You're just, and once this you is, get the hang of it, yeah. once you get where you can go, okay, I can pee because you got to test it. Yeah. And it's just like this nice warm down your leg. And you're just like, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> And the funny thing is what you do, you go up to a, someone else's car and you're talking to them and you kind of put your leg kind of by the tire on the inside and you and just, let it rip yeah, yeah. and you walk away. And then all of a sudden you see this great panic because they think they're leaking yes. fluids and somebody's going to go down there and smell it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so that's just, uh, so I'm, I'm, wearing one, I'm wearing one right now. Well, I, that was going to say, you know, <laughs> I was going to say, you, <laughs> I was going to say, you know, we should probably tell, tell the listening audience to take the kids away because Ray, Razor is going to actually demonstrate the application. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually have two on right now, hmm. but here's the thing. They are wonderful. They are absolutely wonderful until it goes wrong. Yeah. And then it is not good. Yeah. It's not that's all. Uh, As a nurse, you know, I've had to, I've had, I've had to apply those on a lot of male patients, and yeah, it, it when it goes wrong, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. It's, right. it's a mess. But you know, it is a lifesaver. And yeah, I, I never even thought about using one sitting in a blind, because um, I know man. you, you got to pee every twenty minutes, man. Oh um, and like in a leopard blind, bladders like that big. Move where you can't move a muscle in a leopard blind. Yeah. If you had that thing on, you would be golden. Mm. Because for me, like being in a leopard blind or something like that, the, the anxiety of worrying about making noise yeah. is bigger. You know what I mean? Yeah. Things happen. And so obviously when you get anxiety, you pee or whatever the heck you do. But man, yeah. that would be, that really would be a, a beautiful thing. And I, I will, like, if I hunt leopard again, which I hope to, I will be wearing a catheter. I promise you that. So... so. Could you explain, maybe Joe can in his nurse way, how this mechanism works? I mean, okay. it's not like a catheter at the hospital where they insert it. <clears throat> no, the, since Razor's well, wearing one, he can tell you about it. See, gravity works on a plane of... No, so what it is, it's a condom-style catheter. Okay. It's a condom that basically has a hole in the bottom of it. Don't and get them mixed up. Okay. Don't get them mixed up. And then it has a tube on there. Okay. And uh, then the way you do this one, it, it runs down your leg and you put a little tape. Yeah. And then it goes all the way out your pant leg and you tape it to the corner of your shoe. Yeah. You follow me? Yep. And um, or you can hold it in your hand like this, the tube, and when you pee, just start doing this. <laughs> <laughs> or if That's you're really fun. or if you get stranded in the desert and you get really thirsty, it becomes a it becomes a camelback yeah. reservoir. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's a good thing to do to your navigators, you know, is is kind of like slide it so he thinks it's his camelback. <laughs> that wouldn't be good. Yeah, I like no, it really is. It's a it's yeah, it's like the wonderful, wonderful thing. It even they even make them for women. I don't understand that. I Joe. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about it right now. I've, I've okay. yeah, I, I, it's yeah. Oh, sorry about that. It's a reservoir. It's a larger reservoir on both the uh, on the t on the uh, 
on the proximal end in, in, in legal medical terms, the proximal end reservoir closest to the human body is larger for women. Let's just mm. put it that way. Why? Let's, let's just say that the, the coffee cup's much bigger, <laughs> um, more surface area to cover, but, uh, I, I digress anyway. Um, <laughs> Oh, wait, 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 wait. One more thing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I know this is not good. And I promise there's stuff not, but this is what's so funny about this stuff. So you're going to buy one, you know, buy this catheter kit and you're reading about it. You know, you kind of, you know, at first you're like, you don't want anybody to see you. you know, why? I don't know why, but, you know, and then all of a sudden, so you have to give the size. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. And, and, and it's like, you know, it says on the package, it says, this is not the time to, to, you know, <laughs> you know, or it will not be good for you. You know what I mean? But it's so funny and you're trying anyway, that's how I'm going to go there. Yeah. So, yeah. Go. so, so you, you typically buy the case of pediatric sizes razor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, it's, no, it's not by it. small, medium, large, it's by age. Five-year age ranges. Razor, Razor likes the uh, uh, the eight to twelve-year-old uh, size. So, <laughs> anyway, well, the worst thing was, uh, uh, the f I got mixed up one day and I put on. Remember those like snake things you put on the the garden hose when you're a kid? And you oh yeah, water, water wheelies. The water wheelies. Yeah, I, I put one of those on there, and that was not good. <laughs> <laughs> was not good. Anyway, I'm sorry. We got to. I'm sorry. Uh, when are we going live? Yeah. <laughs> when are we, okay, we can start recording now? All right. In three, two, one. Sorry. Oh, okay, Razor, I'm sorry. How do you train for these races? Um, well, uh, just basic. So I don't run anymore. Um, but uh, I get on the treadmill. I'll run a little bit on the treadmill, but I, I I'll on our treadmill, I do like incline and I mean, I'm hooking it on my like four miles an hour, you know, and I do yeah. all this and then I'll do um, squats on the TRX yeah. and I'll do uh, some bench, but this is just light. I'm not really like pushing weight. It's more stretching yeah. and toning and it's very basic mm -hmm. and um, and uh, at times not right now, but I'll be riding a mountain bike. But I, I'm really not doing cardio on it. So what I'm doing is I'm doing, uh, you know, real technical stuff. You're going real slow and you're just I have like these little trails and you're just going over rocks and around tree. You know what I mean? It's real technical. So you're really you, you're using eye hand coordination and getting your balance and everything, which to me, it helps your reaction time. It helps your brain get back focused, you know. And so when you get into the car, because they're really it, things are going so fast and there's so much feel in that car, you want all of your senses yeah. firing at once. And so I do that. And, and, uh, and we I swim and we have a lap pool and um, which is so cool. Very fortunate and do that. But I don't do crazy, crazy. I just try to stay in shape. I really should do more cardio. If there's no doubt about it. But yeah. Um, but, uh, but it, because it is it is an endurance sport, mm -hmm. and yeah. also, do you change your diet and your hydration uh, schedule as you oh, get absolutely. closer to the race? Yeah, and and it's funny. I've really started um, now trying to just do better hydration on a normal basis because I think I think my whole life I've been dehydrated. You know, yeah. I don't drink enough water, and and so like the first race, you know, you start drinking water three days before, and that's not long enough. You know, mm. and um, so so yeah, I start trying to drink water, and then I'll drink like liquid IV. Oh um, yeah, and uh, I do a lot of liquid IV, and uh, and of course during the race, you know, we have a water system. You know what I mean? So you have plenty of water while you're racing, but but just keeping, but just starting off really well hydrated because, you know, after ten hours, eight hours. You know, and you granted you were locked in a seat like a fired up pilot, you know what yeah. I mean? And you are locked in there and you're not moving. I mean, your arms and your feet can move and that's it. And so your body has to be um, has to be strong. The muscles have to be strong because like I got wrapped up because I was you know, I had in the hospital three days. Right. And, um, and because of that. And uh, and but that wasn't because of lack of hydration. That was just because my muscles got my, my left 
butt, butt cheek, butt cheek. Guy. You're yeah. yeah, whatever. So th- no, it's very, very important. And then like before a race, like when we do the mint, I'll go and do uh, an IV treatment, you know, basic IV tri- treatment. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, and I think some of that, it's big health, but I think a lot of it's mental health, <laughs> you know? Sure. And, uh, but the main thing too, believe it or not, is, is the mental part of it. Um, because the whole time that I'm racing and really doing anything, you know, you're fighting off negative stuff, you know, Oh, I hope this is, Oh, I hope this is okay. Oh my God. You know this. And then when you first start this race and you're 15 minutes into it, 20 minutes, and you're like, Oh my God, I've got 10 hours left. You know what yeah. I mean? <clears throat> and so just training, and this is something I've tried to do my whole life, but really more is just training my attitude to focus, right? To focus and literally like negative stuff. I literally breathe it out. I literally breathe it out and just, and that's why I tell all the guys in their team, it's like, we're visualizing, you know, we, we plan for everything, but we visualize being at the finish line and we, not how we got there, not what we had to do, but we are there and we are having so much fun. And and uh, and I, I believe that's probably the best preparation that that we do, or at least me. Hmm. So for 10 hours, I mean, I guess it speaks to how important the playlist is that you listen to. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Well, we've thought about that, but the navigator, the problem is the navigator is giving out so many constant commands. Okay. And because uh, he's reading a, a GPS called lead nav is what we use. And it's literally, I mean, it's throwing up everything. And it, it's constantly uh, hard left at 300 400, I mean, 300, 200, 150, you know, blah, blah, this, 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 checking that, you know, I mean, it's a constant, yeah, yeah, constant mantra. And, and so he is monitoring all the car stuff, the, the, the temperatures, everything, Mm -hmm. and, and making sure we're on course and all the dangers and stuff. Also, anybody behind us so we can get run over. And all I'm doing, I'm focusing on the road. That's it. I don't flip any buttons. I don't do uh, anything. And I just, jeez. you know, and even like on the radio from the, from our pits, I cut their train. I can't hear what, what they're saying. I cut that off because it's too distracting if you listen to oh. them because it's that, you know, and some people may not be that intense, but that's how we do it, you know, and all he's the brain. I'm just the driver. You follow me? Yeah, and, familiar, uh, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of like riding around with my wife. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's so funny. My I'm like, would you just let me drive? And she's like, you're the one bragging about your navigator, telling them that he tells you everything to do. You know what I mean? So, <clears throat> but it, it, it's uh, it's fascinating, but, but you know, it's a mental thing, you know, and and the preparation going in, having your vehicle and everything. I mean, every bolt is marked. Yeah. Like has a line, and everything is checked. Everything's been taken apart. And when you come into a pit, everything is checked in a heartbeat. And uh, it's it's fascinating. I mean, it really, it, it's so much fun. And um, you know, you're a caffeine addict like Ramon and I. Do you get to have, do you get coffee? Do you get caffeine on the track at all? Yeah, that's yeah, funny. Okay. So I I I really don't drink energy drinks no. not at all ever no. but like uh the navigator does and um uh, so like sometimes if it's a long one i may i but i love a red bull and i just don't drink but i'll have like a red bull or something but i drink water and uh no coffee but he gave me some energy drink one time we're at a pit and he was like here drink this and let me tell you something i, I mean i was like holy moly <laughs> you know is that legal <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, it was some kind of, I don't know, I've never even heard of it before, but. but it had a, like a white powder around the rim? <laughs> yeah, that's it. No, it wasn't liquid. Oh. It was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All this. <laughs> oh, but, man. No, but yeah, that, that's the thing is staying up, uh, you know, because, you know, like at the Mint, you know, we, we're, we're out there sometimes at 2.30 in the morning, you know. And you're going and it's dusty. You can't see at all. 
in, in, you know, depending on the situation in it. I mean, I've, I've hallucinated, you know, yeah. like when I got that rhabdo and stuff, I was hallucinating. I don't even remember like driving much. Mm. And I, when I was driving like this, I was so sick. I didn't know what was going on, but like my kidneys were shutting down and all that. But I was driving and then it dawned on me. I'm looking from above the car. That makes any sense. I yeah. can't explain it. But like yeah. I wasn't looking out the window or whatever. I was up there. Wow. The most bizarre experience. It's kind of like when you put a good ribeye in front of me. Have the same experience. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> 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 But it, it's uh, it, it's a lot, a lot of fun, and and uh, and I hope I can do it for a long time. You know, is that race going to the Baja One Thousand that you're doing this year for the first time? Is that going to be televised, or can people watch you? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it'll be live streamed because it's so big. I think some live, but but they do a TV show. Out of okay. It. But but uh, uh, but you know, it's funny when you watch these on TV, you just can't get the gist because they're no. so. But the MIT 400 will be televised, and they on the MIT 400, they do a televised like two television shows. They do unlimited classes and limited classes, and then then they they live stream the whole thing. Mm. Wow. So, um, but uh, it, it's exciting. It's exciting. So, That's cool. That's neat that you've discovered that later in life too. It's yeah. You know, yeah. I've I know always, you, I've I know always you don't loved it. Yeah, you don't sit well, so you've always got to have something keeping you busy. But it's just when you when I walked out in your garage and there's like two cars up on trailers, like, what are you doing? What's <laughs> going on now? You know, this oh, this is my new hobby. I'm Baja racing. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's I'm just very grateful I get to do it. I've always liked that stuff. I just never had the time or yeah means to do that. You know, I've done motorcycles and BMX and all that when I was younger, but yeah. Do you have any other racing questions, Ramon, before we shift gears here a little bit? Pardon the oh, pun. What happens in a pit stop? I mean, when I think pit stop, I think NASCAR, right? But I mean, they're driving on, you know, on a road. You, right. Uh, so what are y'all, what are y'all doing in a pit stop? So, so like in some races, there's, there's uh designated pit areas, right? Okay. Okay. Like even though you're out in the desert, there'll be, and Baja, there's not, you just, you have to manage it. So, but now, and everyone's different, you know, how they do it. But like, this would be like, if we're going to get fuel, if it's a, a fuel stop, like we'll pull in, so you pull in and Brack dumps a big orange cone on your hood. That means you do not go until we can remove this. Hood. Okay. And so, and he's talking to us and there, there's a, uh, there's one guy that's, refueling and he has to wear this big fire thing and then there's one guy that has to be on him with the fire extinguisher and then the other guys are ch are going around checking all those bolts that have lines yeah you know, they all have to line up if there's a little bitty movement it means something uh, so they're retorquing the uh the tire they're checking everything as fast as they can and brack is giving us like 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 as we're coming in we may say yeah uh we want a cliff bar or we want, you know, whatever it may be, or, Hey, there's something, or he's given us some information and we go in and it's fast. And, uh, and just like you see in a pit stop yeah. and then they take that cone off and you rip it, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and then we'd also do some, we like, if we don't need fuel and we're doing just the eyes, it's called the eyes. We just go in and they're just checking everything because things just break. I mean, and that's the main thing is just making sure nothing is coming loose. So, yeah. but, but yeah, but they're like in the Baja, there's people that swap whole transmissions during a race, or blow wow. a transmission. And they, I mean, and they have the, I mean, they're teams with helicopters. And Jeez. It is wild. And, hmm. um, and we, we have, have, we, uh, go ahead. no, go ahead. No, and, and like on this, on this, uh, uh, Baja, you know, we have spare differentials and, steering racks and all that stuff that we can replace if we're in the right place at the right time you know what i mean mm -hmm. and um so but so that's that should, should we uh should we do the big reveal uh, uh, uh unleash the secret for ramon uh, the big big announcement can i tell him ramon i mean razor can i tell him what's that Ramon Razor uh, has. Uh, we talked before the show, and he wants to hire you as to be his catheter technician for the uh, for the Baja <laughs> right. One Thousand. 
he needs a new catheter technician. <laughs> the last guy had cold hands. So right. um, you can't wear gloves because it's just not the same. Yeah. No, no. My hands are small, so that'll help the ego. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, wait, what time does this podcast air? It it is, is, whatever you want to download. Okay. If it was after 11, I could keep going, but it's <laughs> no, it'll be early in the morning. Um, so, uh, so, so you've got that racing thing and I know you do a bunch of other things, but you're also, uh, you're also a volunteer firefighter. Uh huh. Of course. How long have you been doing that and why? For, uh, three years. Okay. Well, I, uh, so when, why, why do I do it? Well, I've always, uh, I was going to be like a first responder paramedic at first. Cause I have some friends that are paramedics and they're like, and I've always been, I, I figured, I felt like I was always like, I've been around some people that have been pretty hurt, pretty bad, burn, yeah. you know, broken legs and stuff. And I've always been very calm, you know what I mean? And like problem solver and like, mm -hmm. and I just kind of felt like that would, maybe that's maybe some area I should have gone in. So anyway, so, so uh, I was going to do the paramedic thing and then, um, I decided just to be a firefighter first yeah. and, uh, and, um, and that's what I did. And I, I, I did it to support our community. We have a fantastic fire department here in center point and, uh, unbelievable. I, I had no, my, my perception of the, of like the volunteer fire department for us was, I was thinking back in the eighties, how fire, how VFDs were, mm -hmm. I had no idea. I mean, it's a full fledged, department i mean we've got three fire engines and big million dollar fire i mean you name and all these vehicles and safety i mean i mean we fight house fires apartment fires high water rescue and we do all the training and it's just mind-boggling and how but, much um, do you get paid for that nothing <laughs> you get nothing <laughs> but but the reason i did it and i had a calling but but you know when i when i finished doing the show um I wanted, you know, I was, I was doing some writing stuff and I was helping my wife's business and everything, but I had all this time yeah. and, um, and it's like, man, I can, I can volunteer. I mean, we have a great department, but since I didn't have a nine to five, I'm available nine to five, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? And so a lot of people that are on the fire department aren't available nine to five. And, and, uh, and boy, that first summer, I mean, I think we did a hundred calls Jeez. Wow. that year that yeah. summer was like every i mean i and i remember going is this normal and they go it's a little bit higher than normal but it's just pretty normal i had no idea i mean we're cutting people out of cars fighting structure fires and and uh and i mean it's exciting and and, and it's that working with the team it's the same thing as racing you're trained with these guys and you're going and it's all teamwork. It's all, everybody's got a job and no matter what you're doing and, and, uh, and, and, you know, being in a rural area, there's not, there's no fire hydrants. Yeah. So you have to haul all that water. So, oh, wow. so pi picture this, you go to like this apartment fire. This is a true story. Go to it. You know, there's no fire hydrants. So immediately we know that you get an active 911. It's a computer call. It has all the information and stuff. So we're, we're, we're calling, you know, our tenders, which are basically water carrying trucks, but they're very high sophisticated uh, tankers, you know? Yeah. So three of our engines get there, our guys get there, the tankers. So, so they're hooking up to our engines. So we can spray water, but then they're dropping all these drop tanks, these big drop tanks. And they are, they are traveling to where they could get water out of a river, they're drafting out of a river, or there may be a fire hydrant 10 miles away, and they're just leapfrogging nonstop, this, this whole water thing going on. And, and just to keep that organized and flow, it's amazing. And uh, to watch these guys, and they're running the trucks and all the pressure and all that kind of stuff. And um, it's just a, it's an ordeal, it takes a lot of people. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. so it's fun. I mean, I, I really enjoy it. I mean, some stuff is not too fun, you know, I mean, yeah. you get to see some, some not so pleasant stuff, Yeah. but, but I enjoy the, the people and, um, and it, and it's the least I could do. 
Yeah. It, it's yeah. And, and people don't understand, you know, that, like you said, people don't fully comprehend what a volunteer fire firefighting group department does and how how it's not like oh we're going to call the volunteers out to go handle this little thing but you know you you guys are it you're the front line and the other thing that's really unique about your situation being in the texas hill country you guys are you guys can go everything from fighting wildfires to high mountain you know uh, not high mountain but hill country rescues people getting lost i mean in that part of the world it's it's i'm sure you see everything on top of right. motor vehicle accidents and all these other things. I mean, it's not plane like crash. We had a plane yeah. crash. Hold on. What was the craziest High thing? You, what's the craziest one you've had? Not the most gruesome. I know you've had some rough, yeah, yeah. rough things, but um, I'm trying to think. I mean, was it that time you had to get the uh, Foley catheter out of the tree? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> but, but I, well, I'll tell you, like, I mean, like, like, uh, you know, we, we get called for mutual aid all the time. So like even from Kerrville, like they'll have a fire and they need support. They call us or Ingram, you know, like we're Woodbury taxidermy and all that. And uh, so like one time we went to this fire, it was a big structure fire and it was spreading into a church and we're all there and we're fighting and we get it under control. And then the fire started again, like three blocks away on, on a lady's roof from Embers and then started another two blocks. away. I mean, it was nuts. You know, and, um, uh, you know, it's just uh, great. I learned a lot about fires and I'm surprised in, 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 you know, in my younger days, I didn't burn down the state of Texas. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, it is crazy, but I'll tell you a funny story. So there was a, a, a like a, a little apartment complex on fire and uh, I came out of the, uh, the fire engineer, you got the whole SCBA, you know, you're, oxygen thing on you look like Darth Vader and I'm coming out it was just like a movie this lady grabs me she says my cat's in there save my cat please and I was like you know what I mean <laughs> so I we so me and the other firefighter it's, it's two of us go in with with the hoe you know we the the chief does a there's a 360 and then he tells you that, okay, the fire looks like it's in this thing. So you're going in, you go in, you go down, it's all smoky and you go through this door. I mean, all this stuff. So we got the fire suppressed, right? To where some other guys came in and anyway. And so, and then I remembered about those cats. You can't see this bar in front of you. It's all just black. Yeah. So I'm searching for this cat. And plus at that time there was possibly a missing person in there and and so you didn't know what you're gonna find so when that was cleared and a bit of the people i went cat hunting and uh i found this one cat i don't know how it was alive but i got it and it was pretty you know yeah but i couldn't find this other cat i couldn't find i was going through all the other little apartments i could and then i got to do all this other stuff too and and uh, and i was thinking by this time there's no way a cat could still be alive in that smoke. I mean, there's yeah. no way, but I kept on going in. And anyway, so this is a funny thing. I went I, and I was about done and I was like, oh, I'm going to look under this one bed one more time. And I look underneath there and it's the biggest freaking Siamese cat I've ever seen in my life. And it's oh, like, wow. you know what I mean? And it's like a Siamese, it looked like a mountain lion. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I was trying to figure it out. So I grabbed this cat. And it was literally like trying to hold on to a mountain lion. Yeah. And, and, you know, you know where, where the first cat I brought out was like, oh, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, like a movie, like the big hero. This right. cat was like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and I mean, you know, and I, I, don't, I guess as a preface, that I do not like Siamese cats from when I was a kid. I got my lunch eaten yeah. by a Siamese cat. But, but that was a funny one. But that was cool, you know, but yeah. Um, I don't know. There's just so many things and, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it's crazy, you know, but it's cool. You know, it, uh, you just work with a lot of, a lot of the EMS guys are really good and, and you just never know, you know, when that phone goes off yep. and it's fire calm and you, da -da 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 -da, and you look and it's reading out what the call is and what, you know, and the map displays and all this kind of stuff man it's it's crazy and being a volunteer i'm on 24 hours a day every day yeah we don't have days off i mean if you can't go you can't go but you say everybody goes anyway 
It was like that time. Don't know. One time he was in, in the middle of a hot yoga class and they, they, they went off and he goes, I can't go. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> yep. And we lost two cats that day. <laughs> That's messed up. Cause he was doing, we had a call yoga. today. <laughs> really? we, we had a call today. Yeah. It At, was a gas right now. <laughs> and yeah. you're still, you're still there doing a podcast. <laughs> well, yeah. But, uh, but no, it's good. It's really, it's really good. And you know, one thing, there's a job for everybody. You know, we have older guys that were firefighters when they're younger, but now they're, they are running all the, the pumper trucks and every, you know, they know, they're, I mean, you got to know how to operate that stuff properly and keep the flow of water. We have, I mean, all kinds of, there's a job for everybody. Uh, Ramon, then, you know, if, if this radio t- and podcast thing doesn't work out, well, I, I can start the fires. I can keep them in business. Right. Exactly. Arrangement. How, what yeah, about it's cool. Situation? Can you cook? Can I cook? Yeah. I, I mean, just, fire station. No, I no, I don't do that. Okay. I just, uh, I don't cook. I just kill it. You know, he, he <laughs> that's just, I'm not a cooker. He, yeah. I'm a he, cooker. I, <clears throat> I mean, I'm a killer not a cooker <laughs> and i told my wife man i really wish i would learn more how to cook because it's fun but yeah. i just never you know i don't here's my thing i don't think about food until i'm starving mm. which is bizarre and that's, i never that's realized true. You're, that. yeah you're not a grazer i've hunted with you many many times you're not a grazer in camp it's like okay it's a razor come eat it's time to eat and then you'll go eat but it's not like you're yeah yeah, and food to me is nothing but energy. And it's I never really thought about that to my wife. Mentioned. She goes, you know, you don't think about food. You yeah. know, like people think, oh, tonight I think what we'll do is yeah. we'll make this or whatever. And they get kind of excited about it. Oh, it'd be cool. I don't think that way. I mean, I don't think about nothing until I'm starving. I'm shaking. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I don't know why that is. I love good food. I love sushi. I love all that. But I've just. I'm sorry. You said you love I didn't have food. to eat, I wouldn't eat. He I didn't, if I didn't have to food, eat, and then you said you it, love. It, it ruins my. To be honest with you, it, it eating lunch and breakfast and all that stuff gets in the way. It's just time waste. For me. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. I'm a weirdo. I know I am, but I just it just gets in the way. So. Ramon, he's not invited for Thanksgiving this year. No, nope. no, but I like good food. I like good food. <laughs> I went over to Joe's house one time in San Antonio, and he just got a bucket and just threw all this, all this Cajun food all over the table. Remember that? We're all oh, when oh, we did the crawfish bowl and the shrimp. Oh and... man, that was good. Oh yeah. See, Joe cooks fantastic, and he's mm. talking about this and this, and I have no idea what he's talking. My my wife's an excellent cook, but I, I cook a few things well, a few things well. And I know Ramon's a good cook too. Yeah, Joe makes a good housewife. All right, well, told you, Joe, <clears throat> could have made it. Listen, I I yeah, hey, you 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 mock that for you young bucks listening, but uh, I've got some secrets for you. Learn how to cook. My wife still remembers the first time I cooked a meal for her when we were dating. Chicken part, no chicken cacciatore. She'll tell you, Joe cooked kitchen chicken cacciatore, and then he cleaned the dishes up. She goes, "That's what got me." Wow, wow. that caught my attention because I'd never seen a man do that before. And um, yeah, she's an excellent cook. Um, but uh, my mom taught me to cook. I mean, I grew up cooking since I was six years old. We just had to. That's that's the way it was growing up. And I have a love for food. Raise you. We all three have a love for food. But, you're just wired differently that you don't plan for it and think about it. Ramon and I are thinking about where we're cooking Saturday afternoon when foot, when the football games are coming on. Yeah. I've already got the menu planned, you know. Right. And I wish I was that way. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Because it would be fun to do that. Yeah, but there's you know? a reason why we look like this and you look like that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, no, wait a you're, what do you we? Well, <laughs> Ramon, he's he's like a third of what we weigh. Uh, he's yeah. just. He's got that endomorph frame. He's just he's just built differently because he never sits down. But uh, um, yeah, I'll, we could talk about food all day. I'm getting hungry right now. In fact, I'm gonna have to go because I got yeah. something in the oven. But, um, somewhere around here. So let's let's kind of circle back here in the last part of the show. Uh, you're known early on for hunting, uh, being a great cameraman behind the camera. You and I met. Um, you didn't. We didn't even know each other. We got paired together to go to the Ar- near the Arctic Circle to hunt caribou and things like that. But your kind of your trademark calling card 
Um, if we had to write a book about Razor and he was an assassin, he would be the assassin that was known for um, that was known for killing people with a ten millimeter. That's kind of your calling card. That's your trademark. Yeah. How how how? And you killed a lot of stuff and some really big stuff with a ten millimeter yeah. pistol. How did that ever end in your mind? You go, okay, I've done bow hunting and rifles. Let's start hunting with pistols. Well, well, it, it happened a long, long time ago. So um, uh, Ted Nugent and I were going to go to Africa. This is 95, 1995. And, um, and I was going to bring a, a Cars 357 revolver. Mm -hmm. And um, he told me, um, no, go, go buy a Glock 10 millimeter. And uh, this is 95. This is 10 millimeter was dead. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh, so I bought one and uh, I loved it. You know what I mean? It was fantastic. And uh, so I immediately, like I had it like two weeks and I shot a feral goat with it. You know, we were hunting and, and uh, killed it dead as a hammer. And I could shoot it really, really good. It was just a right out of the box gun. I could shoot. So like I would go bow hunting and or rifle hunting, whatever. And then like I would shoot pigs with it. And it was just, some, I didn't even really think about it. You know what I mean? I didn't think about it as like being kind of odd or something. I just did it. And so, um, uh, I, I don't know. I shot a ton of hogs and a deer here and there. And anyway, so when I got the TV show, you know, and I always carried, I carried a gun legally since 1995 and I carried the full size Glock model 20 mm -hmm. for, I mean, I still have the gun, you know, yeah. I wore it everywhere I went. So when I got the TV show, I was like, uh, and I was sponsored by Dan Weston. I was like, y'all have a 10 millimeter. And they go, it's all discontinued. You know, 10 millimeters were dead. And I begged them to let me shoot their discontinued gun. And they literally gave me one. It was like a hybrid of something they had left over. And um, so I just started shooting, hunting with it. Not for any other reason that I just liked it. I just thought it was fun. And, um, and it was easy. I didn't have to haul anything around. And it's just, it went on, I had a gun on my hip anyway. Yeah. And, um, and then, and then I, but what really changed, I was shooting all different kinds of animals. I shot an elk and shot this and shot this, but what really changed was when I found double tap ammunition and because they were loading full power ammo with really good bullets. And, and, uh, and when I, saw that ammo i didn't go oh this is the answer it was after i shot about 15 animals with it yeah and i was like this is not even the same i'm not even in the same league with what i was with the ammo i shoot before i'm not knocking anybody i'm just saying it is proof was in it yeah and then i then it was obvious to me i knew what that gun could do and i would read and i'd read in like what the gun magazines would say and i, I mean with all due respect they had no idea what they were talking about I mean, really, I, it, it was almost laughable because I was like, I don't know what gun you guys are shooting. And the problem was they weren't shooting. it, They weren't hunting with it. They, yeah. they would write stuff like, oh, the 10 millimeter, it's good for maybe, you know, small to medium hogs. And it's like, and, and meanwhile, you would ask those same people that would write that. How many animals have you shot with that 10 millimeter? None. Or, 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 or they, they would make a list of the top, top 10 ammo right and 10 millimeter for hunting and they would make these lists and then you would ask them well how many animals did you shoot with these none yeah i've never had a 10 millimeter in my hand you know yeah yeah i mean it's but so but what, what i'm getting at is i ended up loving it because i saw how lethal it was and so as this was going on dan wesson brought the 10 millimeter back in line and basically, the only 10 millimeter you could get at this time, Glock still had their Model 20. And, and that was pretty much it. Hmm. I mean, and so Dan Wesson brought, because because I was getting the, I, I was bringing it, I was shooting it on TV. I was shooting every show. I was shooting something with, with you know, deer or whatever. And uh, then they brought more. They brought more. I did my own signature gun with it. And then uh, I wanted to take it to Africa, but they changed the rules in South Africa. And uh, and that's where I wanted it because I wanted to hunt Cape Buffalo with it, yeah. zebra and all that. And everybody's like, that's impossible and blah, blah, blah. I'll save you the, 
so South Africa basically has a law or rule that says to hunt buffalo, you have to have a 375 caliber bullet. Well, if you measure a 10 millimeter, it's bigger than the 375. Yeah. Or, so, you know, we had big meeting yeah. measuring stuff and talking stuff. And so anyway, long story short, I got permission to bring bring that gun into South Africa, wow. which was an illegal gun. Yeah. If I had the permits and I had everything and blah, blah, blah. And then I had permission to hunt buffalo with it. I had to go get okay. And um, uh, on that trip, I shot two buffalo. You know, one was at 35 and one was like at 45 or 55. I wanted to shoot him at 25, but I never could get that close. Mm-hmm. And um, wild buffalo were on the, basically the border of Kruger National Park. And, um, and I also shot two zebra both at like 50 yards and all of these animals, like, like, so the f- first animal I shot over there, the PHs did not know what to expect. There was a zebra at 50 yards and we we're in these bushes and I shot the zebra right in the Chevron, right where you'd hit him with the rifle. Yeah. And he busted out of there, ran like 85 yards and flipped over dead. Complete pass through, through that big stallion zebra. Wow. They were like, Oh my God. So two zebras, uh, a wildebeest, Warthog, water butt. I mean, I don't know, 14 big game animals, all one shots with the 10 millimeter, plus two Cape Buffalo that went 85 yards and fell over dead, which was phenomenal. I've shot a lot of Buffalo. I, I say a lot. I've shot a six or seven Buffalo with, with rifles. I think I may be overstating. I think that's what it is. Or five Buffalo with the rifle, never shot in that, never killed them that quick. Right. It's always been a shootout. <clears throat> but I'll tell you why I believe what, what happened. Number one, I knew the gun because we did all our testing before I went over there. I knew what the gun was capable of penetration wise. I knew where I had to hit. Could I mess up? Yes, but I had to hit him correctly and it's over. But what happens is when you shoot a buffalo with a with a three seven five or larger, when you hit that buffalo, he is getting a huge punch. Right. That right. sends that adrenaline through the roof. And that's what keeps them alive is the adrenaline. You can completely disseminate their heart, but that adrenaline will keep them alive. And that's why you're just keep loading. Bam, bam. And they're bam. They're dead as a hammer. They yeah. just don't know it yet. Yeah. So you shoot them with the 10 millimeter auto right through the same heart. And that on both of them. All the way, one one bullet on one buffalo was underneath the opposite skin, like a like a yeah, pimple. I remember that. The other, one, yeah, the other yeah. one was in the uh, was in the uh, just in the opposite shoulder. But they get hit by that right through the heart. They really, you know, it's like a kind of a little jolt. They don't really know what it was. Maybe a, another buffalo bumped them, and so they run, and they're standing there like what? Meanwhile, they bleed out. No adrenaline. Right. Mm. Kind of like kind of like kind of like when you if you if you kill them with the bow i've shot a couple with a bow and if you don't spook them right if you're lucky and they don't get real spooked it's kind of hard with the bow because it makes you know but you can kill them fast as hell with the bow and arrow right properly a proper bow with a good broadhead in the right part with the in the heart with the buffalo and you can do it (laughs) so anyway i went back to africa killed another one killed elon did all kinds of stuff and um it's you know and i'm not bragging but uh i can shoot it really yeah. well and yeah. that's that's most of it is making sure you hit where you where it's supposed to go so i practice a whole, whole lot and i yeah. absolutely loved it so after i did that that's when i quit the tv show <laughs> i was like i'm done i'm done but um it's like when but, you're you that's know, like when you're playing basketball against your 10 year old kids and you you know you're dominating them before they get to be 15 and you go you're like 20 to nothing okay i used to do this with my kids my three boys i'm like okay i win i'm retired <laughs> exactly. i've done it all <laughs> but it it's fun and and uh, uh i'm gonna go back to africa sylvie and i are gonna go to africa uh, next year with quagga safaris i think they show at uh houston i think yep. they show at houston. yep yep and um, they got a wonderful fifty-something thousand-acre place right in the middle of South Africa. How many year are you and, going? Uh, um, I don't know. Yeah, I think we're going to go late. I like going late. I like going October when it's hotter and drier. It's just what I like. 
Yeah. And, uh, but I'm going to go with the, I'm going to, I'm not going to go through all the hoopla trying to get a 10 millimeter in there again, yeah. but I'm going to go with a, a 44 Magnum, uh, a freedom arms, 44 Magnum, which are fantastic guns. And, uh, and I'll bring a rifle too, but I want to try to get a Buffalo with the 44 Magnum. Yeah. And, um, uh, so, but yeah, we're, uh, we're, uh, tentatively planning to be there in August of next year doing, yeah. doing, doing Buffalo with a bow. So yeah i mean i'm curious we'll have to talk and see where where you're going and all i mean that'd be fun if we were at the same time yeah i'm going out with, uh, yeah i'm going out with louis van bergen over at spiral horn safari so he's uh not too far from vic falls but uh yeah it's uh it's i'm excited because i've never shot i've never shot a buffalo with a bow so mm -hmm. i'm hoping i don't need a catheter and a depends <laughs> for that hunt man I, I the only thing i can say i'm not an expert at anything but but I've been fortunate to be in a lot of pretty intense situations, but I'll tell you this much. Yeah. The, the biggest thing with, uh, with that Buffalo is that when you do get the full draw on one, if you get the full draw on yeah. one, don't, uh, number one, if it's not the right shot, you can't take it. Right. Cause you'll, you'll never see that Buffalo again. Right. But the hardest thing is composure and following through, you know, especially if they do this, yeah and it's the, the you know it's kind of like one of those things it's like you get the full draw you know you're going like, and you're like i am actually here yeah at this moment that we've been talking about for five right. years of yeah my you got to get out of your head stuff. you got to get out yeah, of your and head it's it's it's, it's funny because what what i what i started doing like with the with with the handgun and stuff it really changed everything with me i'm sitting there the whole time while we're hunting, driving around in a blind, whatever in the case. And I, I am shooting animals um, in my head. Perfect shot, perfect shots, the squeeze, the, 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 the grip. Everything was the grip with me, the grip and the squeeze. And like, like we'd be glassing animals, we're not even hunting. And I'm, first of all, I am, I am finding the, the proper shot location depending on how the, how the animal is standing. And then I would shoot and in my head, I would have to follow through like, and I, and if I, and then kind of moved, this yeah. is all in my mind, I would have to do it again. And I would see that bullet penetrate into the animal's heart or whatever the direction right. would be. And I would go, that's how I would do it in my head constantly. So whenever I would get up there, it was, sh when I get up to shoot, yeah. I didn't even think about it. Right. And uh, awesome. I'm a weirdo, man, but, <laughs> but I've screwed up so many times in my life hunting. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been a successful hunter, but I know how to screw up. We all do. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know how to completely get too excited, take it for granted, do whatever, and completely blow it. Yeah, so, we all do. We all we all yeah. make those mistakes, and we just we don't concentrate. Um, what's the closest firearm you have right there with you, Razor? <laughs> Look out! <laughs> what is that? It's a Glock. It, it, it's a Glock forty three. The smallest gun I've ever seen on your hip. <laughs> yeah, I know it, it is a small one, and um, but I was just doing some light gardening this morning, oh, so yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, but well, listen, uh, man, there, we have anyway, kept you. We've kept you for an hour. We're going to have to wrap it up here, but we've learned okay. some stuff. So, uh, famous international ten millimeter hunter, number one, <laughs> volunteer firefighter now a Baja racer and a man who's not afraid to explain his, uh, uh, incidences with, co uh, with, uh, incontinence. So, um, you know, you serve as an inspiration for all of us men as we're getting Thank older, you. um, uh, to battle incontinence, uh, in the daily throes of life. And, uh, man, it's good seeing you again. We appreciate you doing this. Man, and it's and good seeing you. guest number one, now guest number 200. So it's, it's been a blast. Man. Well, well how th lucky. thank y'all very much for asking me to do this. I really appreciate it. You bet, bud. Cool. And we'll we'll talk soon and, and we'll get something lined out for uh I'll be hunting out in the hill country this fall. So we'll get something lined out and then in the spring definitely need to kill some of those birds on your place. Yeah, that'd be fun. That'd be All fun. right, Thank Razor. You so much. Good seeing All you, right. man. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hunting Matters is a Houston Safari Club Foundation production, hosted by HSCF Executive Director Joe Bitar and Ramon Robles. Produced by Ramon Robles. Please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For questions or more information, email us at info at wehuntwegive.org.